Hey, hi, good morning, everyone. Um, and welcome to uh, the latest panel session, uh, which the subject of which is um, supply chain risk management and embedding technologies successfully to manage risk. And um, delighted to welcome our panelists today. Um, my name is Robert Stevens. Um, I work for a company called Climate Care, and I'm also the chair of ICROA, which is a global alliance promoting best practice in carbon management and offsetting. So many of our members are working with corporate partners more and more within their supply chains to reduce emissions and to build supply chain resilience, livelihood improvements in supply chain communities. But before we can do that, our customers need to understand the risks within their supply chains. And that's what we're going to be focusing on for the next hour. In a moment, I'm going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves. But uh, just in terms of the format of the session, um, each one, I'm going to ask to, uh, to present their own experiences for 10 minutes or so. Um, and broadly around the three themes of this session, which are audit, introducing circular economy processes, and um, disruptive technologies. Um, as the session is technology focused, we're going to ask you to use Slido. I think you're all now familiar with how it works. Um, but please do start putting uh, questions in through Slido throughout the session. And then there will be a more traditional opportunity to use your voices to ask questions at the end once the uh, presentations are over, we'll have a Q&A session and we'll take off Slido and we'll also take uh, questions from the audience. So without further ado, I'd like to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves briefly. Would you? Hi, I'm uh, Kirsty McIntyre from uh, HP. Uh, that's the side of HP that is the printers and PC side. We split last year. Uh, I'm no longer Hewlett Packard just to help everybody out. <laughs> um, and I manage uh, our global sustainability operations for HP. My name is Jorgen Karlsson. I'm with Ericsson. I work with the responsible sourcing and heading the supplier code of conduct audit program and some other programs that I will talk about a little bit later in my presentation. Hi, I'm Tim Wilson. I'm a director and founder of Historic Futures, the company behind String3. Some of you may have uh, had a chat with us outside, and we specialize in collecting uh, data, primary data, from the extended supply chain, so collecting data from beyond tier one. What is variously referred to as traceability or transparency or supply chain mapping uh, interchangeably. We actually think they're slightly different things, but uh, anyway, that's, that's what we do. Uh, and we've worked with some of the world's largest brands and retailers, Walmart, Tesco, Carrefour, uh, and uh, uh, brand owners. Uh, a lot of work in the textiles uh, arena, working with Marks and Spencer's, Ikea, H&M, Adidas, uh, those kind of people. Uh, but also working on mining and minerals and looking at uh, gold and diamonds and you know, various other things. So we're, uh, we're product agnostic. We don't, we're not worried about which product it is we're trying to find that information about uh, and trying to come up with tools and techniques that allow you to collect data from beyond tier one. Thanks. Thanks. So, um, Jorgen, yes. if you'd like to uh, start us off. Sure. Let's see if we can get... There we go. Again, my name is Jorgen Carlson, and I'm going to talk about three things. First of all, the risk-based supplier code of conduct audit program. How does it work? Is it efficient and effective? And how can we do it better? Should we change our ways of working or not? Then I'm going to talk about the Supplier Integrity Screening Program. It's a new program where we screen batch-wise automatically every week our supplier base with regards to anti-corruption, uh, bribery, and other uh, factors, indicators. And the third thing I'm going to talk about is competence development. Uh, the traditional way of, of ensuring that suppliers comply is, of course, by auditing them on site. But we can't reach all our suppliers. Ericsson, Ericsson has got literally tens of thousands of suppliers. So we have to find a way of communicating with the large mass of suppliers that we cannot reach through auditing. And one way of doing that is to publish on ericsson.com, free for all, no passwords or anything, training. So we have a number of web-based learnings on our website that, uh, that are available for us, all our suppliers and that we, of course, promote uh, by, through campaigns to all our suppliers. 
But before I talk about uh, the Code of Conduct audit program, I will just very briefly mention the supply requirements we have that are related to Code of Conduct, Environmental Management, and Occupational Health and Safety. Those requirements are published also on Ericsson.com in a number of languages, 10 to 16 actually languages, and they are contractually binding. So in all our supplier contracts, we have a clause saying that the Code of Conduct requirements apply, and they in turn explicitly refer to both the environmental and the occupational health and safety requirements for more detail. So all of those requirements are actually contractually binding. That's how it works formally. But how do we make sure that our suppliers really understand and comply with the requirements? Well, the traditional way and the way we have done it for the last eight years or so is through a, comp a supplier code of conduct audit process. You see it briefly described here. Uh, but as I said, we have tens of thousands of suppliers, and we cannot possibly audit them all. So how do we know which ones we should focus on? Well, we have a risk using a risk-based approach. So we have a very basic, actually almost rudimentary risk model uh, where we apply, you know, we list all our suppliers. We uh, identify, of course, cat supplier category risk, uh, region risk. Have we audited them recently or not? What experience do we have with some kind of subjective factor? Do they work at height, a very you know, high risk activity, obviously work with chemicals, etc. And we get the risk point at the end. Uh, now, of course, everybody understands that it's not the whole truth. And, uh, so, but, but it is a start. So we have, a risk based, we have the risk model, and the result is fed into a management decision process by region and sometimes by supplier category, where the supplier managers uh, also take other factors into account, such as geographical location, uh, s existing and future expected spend with the supplier, et cetera, to create uh, an annual audit plan. Uh, and then, of course, we do the audit. And the way we do it now, uh, and I'm, we'll come back to the, you see on the bottom of this slide, it says in-house auditors versus free third-party auditors. The way we do it now, and the way we have done it for, let's say, eight years, is that we have used internally trained auditors. We have now almost, or around 200 uh, trained supplier code of conduct auditors. Most of them are sourcing professionals, sourcing managers, uh, and they do this as one part of their job. On average, they do maybe two or three audits per year. Um, and they're trained locally. I've, been, I've traveled the world training people, and I've now also co qualified supplier auditor trainers. It's a one-week training with a few days of theoretical training in the beginning, audit methodology, the code of conduct requirement, etc., and then two or three on-site audit at suppliers, so that as part of the training, we actually audit suppliers on-site, and it's the persons in training that do the audits, and I'm there as an observer to help them out, give advice, etc. And that is a, has been a fantastic way of qualifying people in an efficient way and giving them confidence, and also creating ambassadors for the code of conduct thinking, responsible sourcing thinking in the company, covering all, re sorry, all regions and business units. Uh, of course, we have fi there are findings, uh, and there is, of course, you know, the, the process uh, includes, of course, documenting the results, uh, creating corrective action plans that are communicated back to the suppliers so that they can you know, for each identified area of improvement, uh, identify the root cause, suggested corrective actions, responsible persons, and deadlines for completion. And then they feed it back to us. We approve it if there are no comments, and then we follow up as a function of what they have stated themselves as suggested deadlines. The way this, I mean, why does this work? We have had it for eight years, and there are many programs that come and go, and this is actually as vital as it possibly, as it ever has. Well, the key to success, I think, is that it's on the top management scorecard. We measure the follow-up success, uh, and, and we're now at 86% the last monthly reading, and which is a great result, actually. Uh, and, and that is fed into the top management scorecard, so on, a, on the risk perspective. So that's why the program is uh, so successful, I think. Now we've done this with internal resources, and, but we're challenging our ways of working, we're challenging the way we, we uh, think, and now actually we have, it has been decided that we will use a third-party auditor to do the audits, uh, professional auditors rather than our 
amateurs, if you will, uh, gives a better credibility towards our customers, our, our uh, investors, etc., and and will free some resources internally. We, is this a good move or not? We don't know yet. Uh, we're starting this quarter actually, and we're rolling out the external third-party auditor scheme uh, based on our own risk assessment and audit planning, by the way. But then the third-party auditors do the rest. So we will roll it out before the end of. April next year, and then I'll come back perhaps next year and see, tell you how it went. That was one thing I was going to talk about, but when we did you do an on-site audit, you can cover a lot of ground, cover a lot of important things, but there are some things that are in practice almost impossible to cover. And one of those things is anti-corruption, bribery, uh, embezzlement, things of that nature it's practically impossible to find proof of compliance or non-compliance in a traditional audit. So what do we do instead? Well, we have engaged with a third party, a company that um, has got a tool for, which allows for um, continual weekly screening of our supplier base uh, against a number of factors, databases. They have many hundreds of databases uh, in the register the database is for adverse media, so when a supplier name is mentioned in the same article as the word embezzlement or corruption or something like that, it's a red flag. We have warning lists, alert lists, sanction lists. We already had sanctions before, but it's still in the, in the package, so to speak. List of politically exposed persons, so if they are associated with any of our suppliers, it is a red flag. And you can choose or not to choose a state-owned company as a risk indicator. It's relevant in some markets and countries, and irrelevant in others. And we're rolling this out now. It's, we're on our third, uh, sorry, second region, and we're rolling it out in one Mediterranean country now. And the way it works is that we batch upload country by country the suppliers taken from our supplier base into the tool. The screening is done automatically every weekend. We get the results Monday morning. And now the, there is a, an expert panel in, in, uh, in the region itself that first does a pre-screening or pre-evaluation if it's a false alarm or not. Sometimes we have alarms that are suppliers that have almost the same name, but not quite as our real supplier. So obviously that's a, that's a false flag. Um, so we take them out. And then the rest goes to a decision committee. It's a newly formed uh, group. It's uh, high-level people in the regions. It's head of legal, it's head of sourcing, it's head of the supplier category in question, etc. So those high-level people evaluate, and actually there is a meeting on Wednesday in, in Rome, and, and um, there they will evaluate how to go ahead um, to make an informed decision at a high level about this potential indicator of wrongdoing. So and the actions can be to ask the third-party supplier of this tool to make a full due diligence study at an extra cost, but it's not that expensive. Uh, we can put the supplier on hold and make an internal investigation. We can actually state that it was a false alarm after all, even though it's passed through the first screening, or confront the supplier. Or in any case, we make an informed decision. Does this guarantee that we're safe when it comes to these types of risks? Uh, no, but we, when we have implemented this globally, uh, which we will do before the end of next year, uh, before the end of June next year, I should say, then we have done at least what can be reasonably, reasonably be expected from us. And if then anything would happen, then we can demonstrate that, well, we have, we have taken active steps to prevent anything from happening. And from us, without even knowing it, having, you know, commercial dealings with uh, companies that are not behaving uh, correctly. But of course, we, this is one, one more way of, of uh, reducing supplier-related risk. And it's something that's been requested from er the Ericsson board to our chief compliance officer. So it comes from the highest level in the, in the company. Lastly, uh, I don't know how many minutes I've taken, but I have one more slide here, and that's uh, the external trainings I was talking about. We have four web-based learnings that are available on Ericsson.com. It's uh, the code of conduct for suppliers one. It's uh, getting a little bit old, uh, so the plans are now for the coming quarter to update it and, and uh, have a new fresh version out. It's available in 13 languages, both verbally and in text. So because, of course, our suppliers are all over the world and they all don't all speak English, so, so we have chosen to translate it to actually cover the world's 10 of the world's biggest languages, a number of speakers and a few more. We have the conflict minerals training for suppliers. It's quite special. It's relevant for 
a limited number of our suppliers that, that provide components, products that contain any of the conflict minerals, but we still provide the training. That one is only in English. And then we have the anti-corruption for suppliers, which is available, of course, and mandatory internally. We have made an external version adapted for external use. And uh, we have many thousands of suppliers that have completed it, uh, supplier employees. And then finally, we have the uh, OHS, Occupational Health and Safety, uh, primarily for our service providers, you know, suppliers that climb towers, that drive to and from sites, etc. And that's where we have many of our accidents and tragically also every year uh, some fatalities. So that's what we're trying to, you know, prevent in all the ways we can. And this is one thing that, that uh, uh, one such action in that direction. So that's pretty much the supplier audit program, the, the supplier integrity screening, and the training on, on the web. So that's three of the ways that we manage our supply risks. Thank you, Jorgen, and perfect timing. Okay, so um, the other thing, what I didn't mention, my other hat is that I, I lead um, HP circular economy programs as well. And so I thought it was quite interesting maybe to talk to you about how I look at circular economy and how that is helping us to manage supply chain risk. So sort of first of all, I'll start with what do we look at uh, when we think about sustainability at HP? And I think it's worth taking a look at this simply because for us it does cover all of those bases. It does cover everything from uh, the way that we make our products and, and how we put them on the market. Uh, well, you can see them there. That's good. I can see half of the screen on here, so that's, that's okay. You can see it all. Uh, and then, you know, basically how that we improve performance of our products. When we look at our carbon footprint, for example, 60% of our carbon footprint sits with our products in the use phase. But we are getting better at energy efficiency. We are, you know, with the, there will be new battery technology which will come along, particularly for our, our laptops uh, and our, our um, uh, you know, and the computers. And therefore, you know, there, there will be better energy efficiency in there. And then when I look at our carbon footprint, what I see is that a lot of our carbon footprint then sits with our materials extraction and our material and our operations. And so really that's why we're really looking at moving towards a circular economy. It becomes really important to us as we address uh, energy efficiency within our supply chain. And then really it's about, it's about thinking about uh, how, do we, how, how do we enable society as a whole with IT? I think this is one of the really exciting things about working in the IT sector is that it's, just that it's ubiquitous. It, all of us use it all the time it, at home, uh, in our companies, it's almost impossible to get away from it these days. And so, you know, there's a lot of incredible stuff happening because of what IT can bring for people. So how do the two things connect together? I just thought I'd start with saying, you know, this is what a circular economy is. I'm sure you're all very familiar with it. It's that transition from a linear economy where we take stuff out of the ground, we make stuff with it, and we basically chuck it away um, uh, into really trying to bring together um, and closing those loops, not just material loops. I think a lot of people get fixated on circular economy that's just about closing material loops. For us, very much, it's about elongating product lives, making sure that our products are repairable and upgradable. Uh, we are the only IT company, for example, who freely publishes all of our service manuals. So you can go and look up your specific model of printer or PC, you'll download the service manual, and you can have a go at fixing it yourself. And we've partnered with an organization called iFixit who turn those technical service manuals into stuff that you and I would be able to use. I'm making assumptions about your technical capability like mine, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, and they turn them into guides for, for home users to be able to use or fixer cafes and those sorts of things. So, uh, you know, that's where we're going to, and, or, and also the selling of services as opposed to products. So uh, over the last couple of years, we've established, I wouldn't say it's a goal, we've started measuring it, we don't know how to put a goal around it quite yet, but a goal around materials intensity and so really that decoupling of our revenue from our consumption of stuff as a company. And, and we've been quite broad in our, in our interpretation of stuff. It includes packaging and the materials we put in our products and the carpet that we have on the floor in our offices and all sorts of things. So, uh, it, it, and it's, it's showing a slight improvement. It's going in the right direction. A lot to do with the fact that products are getting smaller. Uh, and uh, a lot to do in dematerialization. So the next challenges will be how do we keep it going if products don't continue to get smaller. So 
Uh, how does how does how does sort of supply chain responsibility and circular economy fit together? And I've got three aspects that I think I think it matches up quite nicely. I think the first one really is around commodity price shock insulation. And so you can see from these charts up here, uh, you know, there are potentially there are some um, some um, some difficulties around. If you've set yourself a goal around using recycled content in your product, for example, what we see, particularly in the plastic space, is that the recycled plastic is actually more expensive than virgin resin. Uh, and then that becomes really difficult to continue to justify that uh, with your procurement and commodity teams internally. I'm very much looking forward to the next section uh, of this conference because I'm hoping they're going to help me address that even better. <laughs> so I think, first of all, is really thinking about when you're bringing products back into your supply chain, when you are uh, selling your products as a service as opposed to selling them as products, uh, what you're doing is trying to insulate yourself from these commodity price shocks. And I think, you know, I don't think the world is getting a smoother and calmer place out there. It's, it's becoming more changeable and more extreme in, in what we see. And so certainly we look at uh, that the supply chain and uh, circular economy is a way of helping us to address some of these issues. The other one really is around social responsibility. We spend a lot inside HP uh, assuring our, our supply chain, particularly around conflict minerals. Uh, it's a, a big, uh, it's been, a, you know, a, a big sort of um, pressure area for the electronics sector um, across, the, across the, all of us. And so for us, making sure that our supply chain is conflict free, it is pretty challenging and we spend a lot of money on it. Um, Ericsson didn't talk about how much money they spend. I imagine it's a lot with all of those audits going on. We have similar situations. How does this connect with the circular economy? If I'm bringing those, pre those already qualified materials back into my supply chain to make new products, then I don't have to qualify them again. So if I've already qualified materials in HP product, I can't speak for everybody in the industry, of course. So if I'm then bringing, product, bringing material from other other manufacturers or other industries into my supply chain, then that, that's a different issue. But if we're completely closing our material loops, then I don't have to qualify that material again. It is already qualified. And we can really look at establishing cost savings around that. It helps me build a case for a better circular economy. So the more products I sell as a service, the products come back to me when the customer has finished using them, and then I can use them either to make new products, to asset strip for spare parts, refurbish, don't have to qualify those products again. So for us there, I can see some really nice cost savings coming through on this one. Haven't been able to quantify them exactly yet, but I'll, I'll, I'm working on it. Uh, these are all, this, you know. And then I think the other thing is that we, we're looking at, this is a, an example from, a, from a, a research project we've just recently done in the US. Um, this is about medical plastic. And it might seem a bit weird, but um, uh, medical plastic, actually an awful lot of it is contaminant free. Uh, there's a lot of plastic wrapping that goes on uh, when, um, when items that are used in the medical and the healthcare industry are wrapped to make sure that they are, they are uh, sterile. Um, that wrapping doesn't get contaminated, but there's a lot of it, and it's extremely homogenous. We need truckloads of this coming out, and we're looking at this. And so what we're trying to do is when we're looking at coming back to that, insulating ourselves from commodity price shocks, really establishing a goal around recycled content in our products. Where else are we going to be able to get material which is homogenous, which we know where it comes from, which, is, which has been qualified already, uh, all of these aspects. And so for us, uh, this was a very exciting way. Unfortunately, economically, it didn't work out. But we now know why it didn't work out. And now we can do things to fix it about why it didn't work out. We had a slight too many, we had too many uh, value chain members in there, let's put it that way. A little bit too much logistics and sorting going on. But we can, we can address that. But these are the sort of things that we're looking to address, you know, our, our supply chain responsibility um, and matching the two things with circular economy. So really, uh, that's just sort of a, a slide to sort of summarize what HP has been doing in this space at the moment. So I, I'm hoping that, you know, I've maybe connected two of the, the big issues for you right now with circular economy and supply chain responsibility and helped you see that they, they aren't separate. Uh, and we're certainly looking at them to, to come together. Thank you very much. 
Uh, thanks for coming along, everybody. Uh, I uh, was asked to come and talk about some stories uh, and some experiences. So I've got a couple of little case studies that I just want to run through with you uh, to tell you a little bit about what we've done and what we've learnt and, and, uh, and what we've done with the information uh, as, a, as a consequence. But first of all, I just want to ask, who's heard of iPencil? Who here has heard of iPencil? Yes? And are you thinking of the Apple product that, uh, that Tim Cook walked out on stage and announced about a year ago, uh, and the Twitter sphere exploded with people saying, hooray, Apple has invented the stylus, the pencil. You know, and there was all these uh, pictures of, uh, uh, of, of Steve Jobs turning in his grave because they said they'd never launch a, a, an eye pencil. Anyway, I don't mean the eye pencil. I mean eye pencil the essay that was written by a chap called Leonard Reed in 1958. Uh, and in that essay, he, his thesis is that uh, it's not possible for anybody to know how to make a pencil. And you go, well, that's mad. Of course we know how. He used to work for the Stedler Company. You know, most of us have probably had a Stedler pencil in the past, you know, with the yellow paint and the stripes and the little brass ferrule and a rubber on the end. Uh, sorry, and a razor on the end for the benefit of our uh, Antipodean colleagues. Uh, and, uh, and he said it's not possible for anyone to know how to make one. And it's quite an interesting little essay because basically what he's saying is it's not that the Stedler company are able to assemble a pencil. They buy graphite and they buy bits of timber and they buy lacquer and they buy the eraser and they buy the brass ferrule. But somebody had to make the brass and somebody had to mine the tin and someone had to smelt the tin to make the brass and someone had to grow the trees and someone had to... And all of that, and that's the problem, is the knowability of stuff, of where stuff came from. And that's the problem that we're faced with today in the world, is more and more of the issues that people are trying to address from a sustainable development perspective are these systems-based holistic problems, whether it's, uh, you know, we talk about impact in the supply chain, ooh, impact in the supply chain, uh, and Kirsty was just talking about impact being, you know, for the PC range, mostly being in consumer usage phase. But as a, this is very broad brush, so bear with me, but, you know, very broad brush stroke, in general, for most products, 80% of the impact is in the supply chain, typically beyond tier one, whether that's modern slavery impact or whether that's carbon Im embedded carbon or embedded water or deforestation, those risks that we're trying to deal with are actually way back in your supply chains. So um, I'm going to show you a little, uh, 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 we, we did a, a project with a, uh, a large uh, retailer where we set out to try and get primary information. So I don't mean, inf I mean actually engage all of the people in the supply chain and ask them to give us information or give the system information about how they produce the things that go into the things that go into the stuff that the, the retailer ended up with on their shelves. And we tried to do that at scale. Uh, so we were, and this is what it looks like. Okay, so this is, this is about 12 and a half million items for, a, uh, for, for one retailer. It represents, just to give you a sense of, of, of scale, that's about, we think, roughly 8% uh, of uh, what th went through that retailer in, in a quarter, in one quarter. Okay? So that gives you some sense. And you can see it's pretty, you know, it gets pretty busy. Uh, so the retailers in the middle, this is what's known as a radial node diagram, the retailers in the middle, who they bought from on the next rung out, who they bought from on the next rung out, and who they bought from, and so on. Um, and what you can see, you know, this, I should point out that these are technically rather similar. This is all in the apparel uh, and textiles industry, so they're all bit, basically bits of clothing. Um, but you look at the difference in supply chain structures. You've got, uh, you've got supply chains with lots of verticalization. So you've got one organization did multiple things. They bought something, transformed it, and then transformed it again uh, in the same organization. And then you've got other supply chains where you've got global traders who didn't do, didn't do any processes. They bought something that was already made. They bought the finished garment and imported it, but somebody did the garment making in China, and they bought the fabric from a fabric trader who didn't actually make the fabric, you know, and, and, and so on. Uh, what was particularly interesting was how many of these lines don't radiate out from the middle. So you'd expect if the process are, are mapped onto rings, you'd expect it to go process, 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 back to raw material. But actually, you'll see some of these, a number of lines here are horizontal across the rings. That means that... In this case, a fabric mill was buying fabric from a fabric mill. And actually, that makes complete sense. That happens a lot. You know, if you run out of uh, sugar, uh, you go around to your next-door neighbour and borrow some sugar. I mean, that's basically what happens, right? They, they say, I need some fabric. You've got some of the similar quality. So I'm going to buy it from you. So, so actually, what you realise is that supply chains are incredibly complex, uh, and they change. Uh, they're dynamic. They're, you know, even, if you, even if you're buying the same product from the same supplier today, the chances of it being the same supply chain back to raw material tomorrow for the exact same product isn't very high. That's particularly true when you're dealing with things like in the textiles industry with leather. It's got to be the same animals on account of the fact that 
the last ones ain't here anymore because they were used to make the leather. So, but what's important to recognise here is that uh, we use this uh, our string technology, uh, and so that's, that uses like a friend of a friend. It's a bit like the sort of LinkedIn network that uses processes to connect the dots. Uh, and so all of this information was contributed by the organisations that actually did that piece. So there was a yarn spinner talking about the yarn that they spun, and there was a fabric mill talking about the fabric that they wove and they knitted and so on. Um, and so as a consequence of that, we, can, we also picked up where in the world they are, so we can start to say, well, okay, what does that look like if you put it, instead of doing it as a radial node map, what does it look like if you plot it on a map of the world? Uh, you can see it's pretty busy in Southeast Asia, as you might reasonably expect. Uh, and then you can, uh, you can also do things like this. Because we, we, it's all connected, you can actually say, okay, talk to me, tell me a story of a given product. Tell me about this product. And that's the thing about doing this kind of work in supply chains, is it's never at the policy level. We still need the policies, we still need audits, we still need certification schemes. But what they don't do is you can never go from, you can't, if someone comes in and takes a product off the shelf and says, talk to me about this, you can't say, well, I've got a policy that covers everything. Well, you can, and that's what people do today. But you can't actually talk about that product with any... Uh, any clarity. So this is about the big difference between doing traceability and all of the other work that we've talked about is you end up having to work with products. Um, but because of this friend of the friend technique you can actually understand uh, where stuff, you know, at, at the individual level where stuff came from. So we were doing this work because it was, it was driven out of their sustainable development program. This was about understanding impact, whether it was carbon or whether it was water. We were collecting information on certification status, mass, dates, <laughs> Uh, energy usage, water usage, the inside leg measurement of the guy that was running the machine, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and so you could, you could report back this amazingly rich data on embedded water and embedded carbon and, and so on. Uh, and what turns out is that that becomes incredibly useful from a strategic procurement perspective. Because actually if you can start to figure out how many nodes you have in your global supply chain that are doing this same process, in that same part of the world, you can start saying, well, actually, I don't need to have 47 nodes doing the same thing. It'd be better if I had eight or 10 or something. So I can start now to think about how can I, how can I consolidate my supply chain a little bit, improve quality, uh, reduce risk, and so on and so forth. So it's not, although it was driven out of the sustainable development program, it became very relevant. You know, even things like tariff optimization. So if you're importing goods into Europe uh, from elsewhere, then, you know, knowing where it came from and being able to demonstrate the sufficient value was added in country, all of those kind of things. So it plays much into the, into the, into the wider business much more uh, effectively. So that was one case study. What we learned from that, by the way, because this was about telling about learnings, what we learned from that was two things. Firstly, you can do it. So when we started out doing this a few years ago, the narrative was can't be done. And we sort of went, mm, doesn't sound likely. So the answer is you can do it. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with what's known as the iron triangle, the old uh, iron triangle of project management, cheap, fast, good, pick any two. Um, so if you want good data and you want it quickly, it's going to be very expensive. Uh, if you want bad data quickly, it's not going to cost very much, you know, and all of that kind of stuff. So you can do this, but it's a relatively expensive uh, mechanism, a relatively expensive process to go through. But the business cases are really quite interesting. And then this is another little case study that uh, this is a, a different reason for, for doing uh, actual product level traceability into the supply chain. This was working with Walmart on a range of jewellery. Uh, they wanted to market a range of jewellery that made claims about uh, no dirty gold and no conflict diamonds. Okay, so we've heard a little bit about conflict diamonds yesterday from, uh, from De Beers. Um, and there's also, there's, there's, there's a bad way of digging gold out of the ground, and then there's a terrible way of digging gold. There isn't a really good way of doing it, right? You know, basically, they drill holes, put explosives in, blow it up, and pour cyanide over it to try and get the, the, the gold out. So... Uh, you know, that's a, a fairly messy old process. But they wanted to be able to say that we've only done the good stuff, we are the best way you can of getting gold out of the ground. Um, and so we, this, but this was about telling stories to consumers. So this was about taking that data and taking it through to consumers so that you can tell stories and see whether consumers engage with stories and whether they like having products that they know something more about, especially in the jewellery sector. So, what's in, so this is basically, you can see at the top of the screen, this is the last person in the chain, and as you go down the, as you go down the thing on the left-hand side, that's going back in the supply chain and back in time. And then there's a little map on the right-hand side to show you where in the world it is, and the consumer could take the batch code off their piece of jewellery, and they could interact with this, it, and it was the specific piece of jewellery they had in their hand. Okay? It wasn't just a general idea, it was that one you bought, so in this case the starfish pendant. 
Uh, and what's in, the reason I've used to selected this is just to illustrate this point of, uh, of dynam dynamic supply chain. So here's the Starfish pendant again. It's exact same product. It's got the same barcode. It sells for, I forget what it was, $98 uh, at the till. Uh, so as far as the till is concerned and Walmart's concerned, it's an identical product. We've got now a little, a little spot the difference competition to see who was paying attention between the map on the first one and the map on the second one. Okay. I'm going to make it a little bit easier for you. There's the map on the first one. Okay. And there's the map on the second one. So this is the exact same product, okay? Just bought on two different pur purchase orders and they were about a month apart. And so what's happened here is that the mine of origin has changed and we've now got two mines of origin. And one of the mines has got a refinery on site and they turn it from, from uh, partially refined ore into what's known as four nines gold and the other one didn't. So they sent it to Switzerland to get it refined who then sent it back to South America to finish its journey. Okay, so when we talk about supply chains being dynamic, I just thought this was an interesting example. I happen to have those two bits of jewellery in my drawer at home because uh, I thought they'd be worth hanging on to. Um, just to illustrate the fact that supply chains are dynamic and therefore we need to uh, interact. Uh, we need to think about that when we're, when, we're, when we're going about these things, that they, they are changing over time. So the other learning basically is, just to wrap up, which is uh, the, the String 3 product that we're now uh, out in the world talking about is trying to come up with the sort of optimum, what's the, what's the minimum you can do? What's the lightest touch that gets you some information that's relevant in this domain uh, that is you know, meeting that sort of cheap, fast, good triangle that's affordable, relevant, is able to act dynamically, uh, and is able to be used as part of that wider program and certification and policy writing and on-site audits and what have you to support that, that process. That's me. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to open up to questions now. And Karina, have we have we got any? Where's Karina? Okay. Lots of anonymous. So um, I'll take a couple of these, and then we and then we'll open up for some uh, some non-anonymous questions from the floor. So. Um, Question for Jürgen. Um, how supply risk upset, uh, ass assessed? With supplier self-assessment questionnaires, um, which tools do you use for data collection and analysis? Yeah. Uh, first of all, we do use, I didn't mention it, but we do use supplier self-assessment uh, but uh, to get information about the, the supplier, not only on code of conduct, uh, health and safety and other practices, but, but also on on uh, some totally different different things, you know, basic company information, some financial information, etc. Uh, but the reason that we do supplier self uh, evaluation is not to get an idea of their degree of compliance, because we have seen through comparison of, of uh, self assessment responses and audit results that there is no correlation at all. Uh, so why do we do it then? Well, it's a great signaling uh, tool, actually. When Before we engage a supplier, they complete the self-assessment questionnaire. There's a lot of questions about code of conduct, compliance, about health and safety, environmental management, etc., anti-corruption. And that way, we send the signal. We include the links to the documents on the web, etc. So it's not only in their contracts, which are perhaps read by actually too few people in the supplier, at the suppliers, but, uh, but buy some more, and they have to search information to answer, etc. So we send a signal. But it doesn't feed into our risk assessment as such. So, I mean, it, it's very, it's so basic, it's almost embarrassing to say. It's, a, it's an Excel-based tool, but with some, a lot of, uh, how should I say, formulas, of course. But, but it's in principle, it is uh, an Excel-based tool that's used in, in all regions. They're assembled in our document management system. We have people, administrators that, that uh, how should I say, compile the results so that we get a global risk list. Uh, but in principle, it's just as basic as that. Uh, so Great. I don't know if that answers. They all seem to be for you, Jorgen. I'm going to, uh, okay. there's, well, there's, one, there's one for Kirsty, and then I'm going to open it up to the floor, and we'll come all back right. to these in a sec. Come on. Um, so Kirsty, uh, yeah, basically what, or do you measure and publish the percentage of uh, recycled circular economy products that go in, uh, sorry, materials that go into your yeah, finished so, products. So metrics around circular economy are quite difficult at the moment. So I touched on a few of them that we're looking at. So we're looking at materials intensity, that's in, you know, how much revenue are we generating from the stuff that we buy, in effect, and that we use. 
Uh, we're also looking at uh, a recycled content and uh, we don't have a target around it right now because of some of the volatility that I touched on, uh, because of the commodity price shocks, because of the, the security of supply. You know, we're really struggling uh, to get as much as we would like. We would like an awful lot more. And so it is actually quite difficult for us to, I mean, we are, let's, you know, I, there are some slides which will come out in the pack, I imagine, which, to, which talk about some of the numbers within our, our materials uh, recovery. But, um, I mean, we're using uh, about a million PET water bottles a day so uh, um, in, into our, to feed into our, come into our feedstocks because we cannot get enough of our own stuff back. Uh, and we, while we'd like to think that people were using our products for all of the time that they have them, uh, we actually know that you probably have them in your drawers and you might have just put them in the attic uh, because you haven't really got round to taking your data off your laptop and so it, it hasn't come back into a utility phase. Uh, and while we would like that to happen, of course, there's plenty of stuff around the world, although we have the WE directive that things end up in landfill still. Uh, and so, you know, it, it is, I sound like I'm fudging, but the reality is it's really difficult to get as much as we would like. And so to publish data around it, it we feel that we would be hanging ourselves out to dry at the moment. But it is an intention. It's an intention that we will increase it, that we will increase the amount of material that we are reintroducing into our products, uh, and that we will, uh, you know, elongate our product lives. I would like us to publish a number around uh, the revenue from products as a service as opposed to outright sales. Again, we need to think about that one and think about how that would be perceived externally. Um, you know, it, it, it's difficult. It's very difficult mm. to know how to measure a circular economy. We're grappling with it, to be yeah. honest. Uh, just a sort of follow-on question from that for both of you. Have you tried any kind of consumer incentives or schemes to try to get those um, end-of-use products back into the system? Yeah, yeah. So we had, um, um, so we run, we run program, we run take back programs all the time. And mm -hmm. so, so for example, um, we sell, we now sell um, ink as a service. And so, if you have a web-enabled printer, uh, you can buy uh, ink on subscription rather than having to go out uh, to the shop and buy your new ink cartridges. And so, when you get that, it gets delivered directly to your house. It's called instant ink, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it gets delivered directly to your house. And, and because your printer is web-enabled, it connects to the HP system. We'll send you cartridges before you run out. Right. Uh, whereas, you know, and it addresses some of the pain points for customers around around ink that A, it's expensive, uh, B, you always run out at a very inconvenient time, and C, it's really easy to buy the wrong cartridges. <laughs> yeah. And so, and actually that program not only is great for consumers, so we launched it about two years ago. Uh, we have over two million subscribers already, uh, and it's growing really quickly. Um, and it costs £1.99 a month. Um, so it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty cheap in comparison to going out and buying ink cartridges. Do you take the old cartridges back as part Thank of Thank you. So in the, in the box when it arrives at your house, there is a recite, an envelope that you put your old ones in and it comes back to us. And we have a, a doubling of our return rate through that program. Okay. So there are incentives. Other incentives we've offered, for example, we worked with one of our big retail channels in the US recent this year, and we offered a discount off the purchase of a new product if you bought any printer back. So it didn't have to be an HP printer, you could put any printer back. Because... And this again comes to that qualification material. We know that the material, that particularly the plastic in these cases, that plastic is, is uh, ROS compliant. And so we know we don't have to qualify it again with our plastics formulators. So we know that all ink printer manufacturers are using ROS compliant plastic. I mean, that's purely from a, from a compliance perspective. Yeah. The social responsibility is a bit different in there. But it, so yeah, we run plenty of them. Right. And sometimes they work really well. Yeah, good. Um, I'm going to open up for a couple of questions from the floor now. Have we got a microphone? Yeah, great. This lady down here. Could you say who you are and where you're from when you ask the question? These are all anonymous, I'd like. Be nice to hear. <laughs> Hi, I'm Terry Slave, and I'm editor of Ethical Corp mag magazine. I just wanted to ask about blockchain technology. That hasn't really been mentioned, and it's seems to be there's a lot of talk about this as increasing the transparency of supply chains. 
Sure. No. So you're right. Blockchain comes up probably one in three conversations that we have. I imagine it is very, uh, you know, it's spreading very fast as a concept in people's minds. What's really interesting about it is the concept in people's minds is hugely variable because they don't really understand blockchain terribly well because it's quite a difficult concept to get your head around. Um, uh, and we are, you know, supporters of blockchain. We don't use blockchain in our in our technology. Um, but that's only, it's a matter of how the data is stored more than, more than anything else. What we observe is that uh, getting from a, from a transparency and supply chains perspective, it is not a technology limited problem. It's a cultural and commercially limited problem. So it's not that if you had blockchain, you would get transparency in your supply chains more quickly. Uh, it's if the people in your supply chain understood why you were wanting supply transparent in the first place, you would get it more quickly, if you see what I'm saying. So it's very much about the people uh, and the culture. And, you know, you can go to more or less any uh, factory anywhere in the world and say, talk to me about who you get your stuff from. And that's a, that's a relatively resistant conversation. It's a frictional conversation. You know, it's getting better and there's more and more... Uh, purchasing agreements that require you to deliver some transparency on demand and all that kind of stuff. But we've been doing this, you know, we do this very lo a lot in a, in a lot of supply chains. And generally speaking, disclosing origin of supply is not something that you do. Um, so it's much more about culture than it is about technology. So, but, but blockchain is, is definitely going to grow. I don't know how it's going to grow in this space. I mean, it's clearly going to grow in the financial reconciliation space because that's what it was designed for and it's very good for. Uh, but I think there'll be other applications as well. <coughs> Any of you want to say anything about that? No, I think, I think you summed okay. it up really well, Tim. I, I mean, you know, data is, you, you put shit in, you get shit out. It doesn't really matter what you <laughs> what you put it into. That's really. quote of the day. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great, thanks. Um, any more questions from the floor? There's a lady over here. Sorry, I'm making you walk from one side to the other. We've got two over there. What, can we have both of those at the same time? Good morning. Uh, my name is Luz Abu Said, and I work as an independent consultant for the US Agency uh, for International Development. And we're working on a, a program that legalizes and formalizes uh, small miners in Colombia, gold miners mainly. My question is about, um, do you use any standard when um, sourcing your gold, like fair mind or fair trade, and if you have, have you found it challenging? Because from our point of view, it's, it's almost impossible to comply with, with some of those standards. And the second question is if, uh, and it's for HP and Ericsson, do you offset the, the emissions that you cannot abate internally? The, the lady there next has got a question as well. I'll take those both. Hello, my name is Henry Lake. Um, I was just wondering, um, interested in your view on some of the technologies that are out there to um, get information from workers um, directly, what your view is on some of that, whether that, how that can be incorporated and in some of the good opportunities that are already coming to the market. Is it, is do you want me to <laughs> jump in? Yeah, do you want to? Uh, I'm just so uh, to the, uh, the lady from uh, USAID, the, uh, uh, we don't get involved in the in the standard setting process. Um, it's not something that HF does. You know, our task is to drive transparency, visibility, and supply chain mapping solutions. Um, so, in that project with Walmart, we they engaged, and we work very closely alongside Conservation International. And Conservation International worked with Walmart to define a good mine uh, within the context of what they wanted to do within the constructs of the of the Love Earth program. So Conservation International were responsible for, and they did make reference to ICMM and various other international standards around mining uh, because they worked with an international mining standards expert. Um, and then there were, you're absolutely right, there were, I mean, in these cases, the, the two examples we talked about were relatively large American-based mines anyway, so it wasn't a big <coughs> problem. But we did start looking at smaller scale mining and, uh, you know, uh, and then you do start to get these issues of, of can they actually reach compliance? Are they even reasonable? Uh, you know, is it a reasonable framework to apply uh, in the circumstances in which they're trying to operate? Um, and you end up with a quite an interesting <laughs> difference in worldview of what's okay and what's not okay. Um, but that's so that's a debate that we're aware of, but it's not something that we we drove. And it was it was in the program, but not through us. Through it was through CI. And, and 
I'm not sure if you guys both have gold in your supply chain, but I mean, it, yes, it, it, it kind of applies to uh, to yeah. other. Ericsson is part of you know, the, well. the conflict minerals free smelter program mm -hmm. together, you know, in collaboration with the ICC and, and, and Jesse industry associations. So, and we report to the SEC in the US as we are listed on NASDAQ and we make, you know, business in the United States. There is no currently no offset program, uh, as you mentioned, to answer your question. Then you, uh, there's another, another question regarding whether we interview employees or not. And in audits, typically in, in uh, Chinese factories, for example, or East Asian factories, that's one important part of each code of conduct audit to, to uh, interview a number of employees on, uh, you know, anonymously and, and uh, protecting their integrity and, and the drawing from that. Uh, so that is one step. And then another thing that Ericsson did last year was uh, in collaboration with Vodafone to uh, do a pilot, a mobile survey pilot at a number of Ericsson suppliers in China, where we, together with Vodafone in collaboration, uh, used a, a, a third party that provided a solution that, which enabled employees uh, to answer a number of questions anonymously via their mobile phones. They got to draw a card with a number that, so it couldn't be associated with any particular person, answer a number of questions related to health and safety, uh, you know, labor rights, et cetera, and then communicate it to both Ericsson Vodafone and to the supplier management in question. And that was a triggering, had a fantastic triggering effect for some of our suppliers that got not so good results as they would expect themselves. And they've actually answered very positively to that in terms of implementing improvements. And to the, of course, claim of both Ericsson and, and Vodafone as well. So that, and that particular case is published in Vodafone's latest sustainability report. So uh, very yeah. similar to, to what Jorgen has said. So, so HP was a founder member of the Electronics Industry Code of Conduct around this. And, and that's really where we try and go back to. And in fact, we were talking about this is that, you know, as an industry, these are pre-competitive issues, uh, very much so. The buying of recycled gold might be a different a different topic, but most of this, particularly around labor rights and social responsibility, are pre-competitive topics. And I think there is a lot more work for us to do as industries to come together uh, and really make it easier for other people to comply um, with certain standards or, or at least around certain core aspects that all of us are looking for. Uh, and I think, you know, this is a growing area and is something that we will, we will work on together um, and will develop. Um, and so I think the standards that are out there will look at them, will look at their efficacy and, and how they manage to, uh, how we manage to move forward and, and those sort of things. Answer your question about offset emissions. No, we don't offset emissions. Uh, personally, uh, I feel that it masks the issue. I'd rather work on reducing the issue that we see rather than offset it. But that's a personal view, maybe not an HP one. I think it complements it myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we are rapidly running out of time. We've got three minutes left. Um, I've got, um, yeah, I think there's, there are a few questions that are kind of similar in that it's really about looking beyond tier one or even uh, tier two. Um, Andre from Schindler said, uh, how do you look beyond tier one? Is it part of your initial risk scre screening? Um, yes. Do you use technologies like Estelle or String? Um, uh, I mean, obviously, you, uh, yeah, you, don't, you don't do that, Tim, no, but uh, Ericsson? No, beyond, Sorry, beyond Tier 1, Ericsson has got well over 20,000 suppliers in Tier 1, and it, it's a challenge enough to, to uh, screen those uh, for risk. And uh, we do dive down uh, in certain cases where there are obvious risks. Let's say a classic example is a tower manufacturer, which is our, our direct supplier. They subcontract the... the galvanization of the tower, and that is the activity which is most critical from a health and safety perspective and an environmental perspective. So in those cases, for example, we always, together with our first-year suppliers, uh, audit the galvanization site. So those are, that's one example. So it's, it's not on a generic, because we have literally hundreds of thousands of second-tier suppliers, not okay. a, you know, let alone the third-tier suppliers. So. And, and if I just pick up that one on a, on a sort of social responsibility front, again, we will look at, because there are certain geographies which are high risk, 
uh, and particularly where we look at foreign migrant workers uh, and people paying for uh, to be employed, uh, we will look at certain countries irrespective of uh, the, irrespective of the tier of supplier in there because of the risk that we feel that there is around that. But um, just to add to what I just said, also we, in our code of conduct, one clause is that uh, our suppliers are expected to and required to communicate. Uh, code of conduct requirements to their suppliers, etc. And that's something that we follow up and is one of the major areas of audit when every time we do a supplier code of conduct audit, we check it. If it's not in place, we make sure that and help, help the suppliers with examples of how it can be done in an efficient way. And we have seen over the years, now we have quite a legacy on, on the audit program and following up on the results, that the situation today is much, much better than it was, let's say, when the program was first started uh, seven, eight years ago when it comes to our suppliers communicating and, in fact, enforcing the code of conduct requ related requirements to their suppliers. Great. But there, of course, there's still much more work of to course. do. Of course, yeah. Um, so we've got one minute left. I just wanted to sort of round up with one last question, which is just uh, to each of you, um, what, what technology, disruptive or other, otherwise, what one piece of technology would make your jobs easier? Well, I don't know. In general, big data and analytics. So we're we're uh, we're launching a program internally on sourcing analytics, with where we um, use you know big data technology. And I'm not going to go into much detail on on how to get the big picture to be able to plan our work better, to be able to consolidate you know large number large amounts of information from different different sources to, to uh, improve our ways of working and also improve our, the control of, of the, and that also goes into the sourcing and supplier area, so to speak, so big data and analytics. Yeah, I, w I would endorse that absolutely, and I, I think it also comes back to maybe it's not a technology, but it is a is a process step, which is that we consolidate across industries. We consolidate, you know, the core requirements of what we're looking for, the pre-competitive yeah. elements. Uh, I mean, I think if I was uh, seriously talking about technology, so there's a number of technologies associated with traceability, like RFID tags and QR codes and blockchain and all those kind of things. And I think they're all interesting in uh, and what have you. But you know, there's no point putting an RFID tag on a tree if you're going to turn it into paper, because you're going to mulch up the RFID tag in the in the process. You know, so um, so I and, and actually, if it was specifically about technology, it'd probably be some better JavaScript <coughs> library or something to make the to, to make the product work better in multiple browsers. But so I'm not sure, it, you know, from my perspective, I'm, not, I'm less uh, focused on technology. I, I agree with the big data stuff. I think the issue with big data is, again, we need to have the right kind of data to feed into those big data analytics in order to yeah. draw the right conclusions from it. And that's, uh, you know, again, if we want to get... <coughs> in the cases when it's not, you know, to an earlier point about, you know, how do you dice and slice? You can't do beyond tier one for everything all of the time. It's just too big a task. So yeah. you have to have this. And when we do need to get it, how do we get the data with sufficient credibility such that you can use it in your big data analytics. I think it's probably a, yeah. Great. Well, thank you. We've run out of time. So if you'd like to just thank the, the panelists, I hope you've enjoyed the session. <laughs>